This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast for everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level. You came to the right place. I'm your host, Jared Turner, longtime resident of China, co-founder of the Mandarin Companion Graded Reader Series, Chinese blogger, and was born at a very young age. My co-host is John Pasden, co-founder of Mandarin Companion, founder of All Set Learning, the Chinese Grammar Wiki, SinoSpice.com, and owns his own bowling shoes. In this episode, I'll give a quick review of the 2019 National Chinese Language Conference in San Diego, and John and I will talk about the different stages of learning Chinese. You'll also get a rant and a rave. Guest interview is with John Dondrea. A Chinese language teacher who shares his fascinating experiences of learning Chinese and living in China long before the information revolution. All this and more. Let's get to it. Johnny, how you doing, man? Hey, Jared. Everything's great. I'm excited for today's podcast. All right, so、uh, you're going to be telling us about an experience you had recently, right? That's right. I just got back from the Chinese National Language Conference. That was hosted in San Diego. Okay, so this is a conference for educators. Exactly. So this is one of the big conferences for Chinese language teachers, and it brings together Chinese educators from all over the United States. Now, these are primarily teachers that are teaching in like elementary, middle, high schools, but also colleges.、Uh, a lot of the schools will be like Chinese dual immersion schools. Or there'll be high school, middle schools that are just offering Chinese classes. You'll get academics that are there, also different personalities, and、um, it's a pretty cool conference. So I was there to represent Mandarin Companion, and I got to meet a whole lot of teachers. It was a really cool experience. And so you were face to face with the shocking fact that many Chinese teachers do not know about or do not use、uh, Chinese graded readers in their curricula. Is that right? Well, it was. It's been great because this is the. I think the second year I've been to this conference. I've been to some others before. The other big one is called Actful. It's the American Council of Foreign Language Teachers. That's for languages that are foreign to the United States, and Chinese is one of the big languages represented there at that one too.、Um, but this one is obviously much more focused because it's just on Chinese, and. There's a lot of teachers that know about us, and a lot of teachers are coming by saying, "Hey, you know, we've used your books. We we know about you." And there's a, surprisingly a number of teachers actually know about you too, John.、Uh, hey, hey. There's, there's teachers I've talked to who know about your blog, and they've known about the work you've done at Chinese Pod in the past. It's also one of the fun things when I have talked to people is that、uh, I say, "Oh,、uh, you know, the Chinese Grammar Wiki," and surprisingly, a number of teachers actually know about that. And they're like, "Oh yeah, that's a great resource." Well, yeah, it's free. It's online. If, exactly. It's so easy to find. And I'm like, "Yep, that's、uh, John. That's that's his baby. He's、uh, he's behind the Chinese Grammar Wiki." Cool, cool. But at the conference, there's an exhibition which、um, I was there when we were promoting our books. But、um, there, it's also has a has a lot of symposiums or breakout sessions that are talking about、uh, different topics about learning Chinese. I whipped up the program here, and it's really interesting. You got some things like here's here's one、uh, breakout session as a cognitive study on Chinese character acquisition, or teaching Chinese with a progressive approach, or Motivating novice learners for high levels of proficiency.、Um, there's just a whole lot of things here. Teaching history and culture through Chinese art.、Um, you have some pretty unique and fascinating speakers there as well. So it, it's a pretty cool conference.、Uh, if you are involved in Chinese education, it's a great thing to attend. Next year, I'm not sure where it's at, but it's put on by the College Board. That's the same organization that puts on all like the AP Chinese. The, sorry, the advanced placement tests in the United States,、um, and so they're a pretty big organization. They do a lot of training and、uh, other conferences like this. But it was a really cool event, and you even got an interview with a teacher there, right? Exactly, and we have a really cool interview. We'll talk about him at the towards the end of our session here, but it's going to be really cool. So the conference was great. So I'm as excited to get back from that, and just had a really good experience. They were talking to a lot of teachers, specifically about like how to do reading in the classroom, how to do extensive reading programs with students, and、uh, just about some of the results we've been getting with students and how it's been helping them and past you know tests and HSK and AP Chinese and all sorts of stuff. So it was really cool. I've had a lot of a lot of follow up and a lot of work to do from the conference. 
All right, great. Looking forward to that interview. So one of the great things about talking with other Chinese teachers is, is to hear stories and techniques or methods for dealing with teaching Chinese because it, it's so foreign for your average, you know, American beginner learner. And um, I think it really benefits to think about the, the frame of mind that a lot of learners start in because it's not the same as just studying Spanish. You're studying Spanish, you know, you learn the word for book is libro and you know, oh, it sounds kind of like library. Actually, those two words are connected. And so you have these cognates helping you the whole way. Of course, the the letters of the alphabet are almost exactly the same. Um, and then you have Chinese where everything is different. Everything is foreign. And you're starting from zero with everything. Um, so, yeah, it's super challenging. So today I thought um, one thing we would do is revisit part of my website, Sinosplice, that talks about the stages of learning Chinese. Um, and I hope that you listeners will think about whether or not you went through these stages yourself and uh, what it was like. Yeah, there's absolutely stages. And I think it'd be great to talk about this because anyone listening to this is going to be able to re relate with some of these stages and you're going to be able to look back and say, oh yeah, I went through some of that. So stage one, stage one, I like John, how you say it, it's called the Qing Chong Qing stage. You know, that's when, you know, that first stage, you, the, the language is just so foreign. You just not doesn't make any sense. It's, I remember the first time hearing Chinese and being like, it, it, how can people make sense of that? It just seems like, you know, gibberish, crazy nonsense noises. Yeah, and it sounds racist, right? And that's kind of the point. It, it's hard to accept that it's even a language when your brain is just totally unconditioned and it seems so foreign, like crazy nonsense noises. So it takes a little bit of study or just even exposure with Chinese people to uh, to get over that. But in the beginning... Yeah, it's almost hard to accept that these people are speaking a regular language just like English. Something else about this stage is now that you ha know some Chinese and anyone here, if you've studied, just even if you're just a beginner or you've, you're advanced, now that you know some of the language and you realize, okay, yeah, it, it does make sense. It has a rhyme and a reason. Sometimes we can go back and we look at somebody, you know, who might make fun of Chinese and they'll say like, oh, ching chong chang, you know, something like that. And you're like, oh, that sounds so racist. That's like, that's not very respectful. But I think uh, I have to look back and realize I was at that stage too at one point. To them, it just, the language doesn't make any sense at all. Hopefully you were a little nicer about it. I, I, yeah, I, I was. I, I don't think I actually went off and did that. But, you know, giving, I think sometimes is giving that a little bit of grain of salt and realizing, well, yeah, it, it sounds totally foreign. Like if we were to hear Tagalog or, you know, some ar Aboriginal language or something like that, it might sound just totally different. Right. So actually, I'm hoping that in the not so distant future, Chinese doesn't really have this first stage because everyone's going to be exposed to it a lot more uh, going forward. So I think my parents, when they found out I was living in China and, you know, speaking Chinese, they had a lot of trouble, you know, getting out of this stage. Like, it's hard to believe that it's not nonsense noises. But nowadays, more and more people are probably thinking that that's kind of crazy. Of course, it's just another language. So that brings us to uh, stage number two, the OK, it's a language uh, stage, which is what you need to be at to be a beginner making progress. I think at this stage, you now can make sense of the basic building blocks of the language. You realize the Chinese characters, they're more than just spooky looking animals. You know, you can start to see some of the different components that are in it. You get a handle on some of the different pronunciations, tones. OK, you hear the first, second, third, fourth tone. And you may not be able to comprehend that whole language yet, but you're like, okay, wait, wait a second. I, I can understand some of these building blocks of the language and it's starting to make a little bit of sense. Right. So this is the stage where you learn pinyin. Uh, yeah. You start to organize how this language works, pinyin and tones. It's, it's a lot of, a lot of work uh, in this stage, really familiarizing yourself with the building blocks of the language, but you know. That's stage two. But I also think this is a, an area where you start to make a lot of progress, too, because you're like you can start saying simple words and sentences and you're like, oh, wow, I, 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 I feel good about myself. Right. I can kind of like I can communicate on some very basic level. And that's exciting. Yeah, it's a lot more progress than stage one, which is zero progress and <laughs> zero knowledge. So anyway, after stage two, you have stage three, which is the I'm speaking Chinese exclamation point stage, which is kind of like intermediate. And this is exciting because not only have you mastered or at least familiarized yourself with pinyin and the basic tones, but you actually know quite a few words. You can have conversations with people. And um, this is exciting because for a lot of us, we never imagined 
when we got older, one day we would be speaking Chinese uh, with with native speakers of Chinese, like in China, right? It's like kind of a a weird feeling for someone with no connection to China from when they were little. Um, but um, it's also a major thing for your confidence. And you're like, yeah, I'm I'm speaking Chinese. I'm connecting with these people that I could otherwise never connect with. I think also at this stage is a, it's easy to get a little overconfident too. Um, you, you really want to use your Chinese all the time. Sometimes you try to, you know, maybe you try to jump in a situation where you quickly find it, the conversation is much over your head, which is okay. And it's good to stretch yourself, but you might actually think you know more than you really do. Yeah. So it's easy to be overconfident or, or just complacent in this stage because you can start to communicate. One thing that'll help jar you out of that is if you focus more on reading. Uh, the characters help remind you that you might have a little ways to go with your studies. I actually have a story about this. When I was learning Chinese, I was I was getting a little more competent. I had been living in Shanghai for a little while at this point. And I had some friends come to visit Shanghai and I got to show them around. So one of the things I liked doing was taking around shopping or going to the market, bargaining over things. And if, at this stage, I was uh, like, oh, yeah, yeah, look at my channel. I can speak Chinese. And I was just saying simple things like, you know, duo xiao qian, like how much is this? Or, you know, trying to bargain in just some of the uh, you know, very simple bargaining terms because I, I really wasn't able to conversational at this point. I got myself into some hot water. Uh, I, I remember they were trying to get some bags or something at this one shop. And I accidentally agreed to not buy just one bag, but something like 10 bags. And then when they brought them out, we're kind of like, wait a second, that's not what we wanted. And then someone got mad. And then, you know, we were kind of like, Buhalisa, like, oh, I'm so sorry. And then it just, it turned into a bad thing. We just left. So sometimes your ego is writing checks that your mouth can't cash. But anyway, it's good progress, right? And you'll probably be at this stage for a while because this is what I, what I labeled the intermediate stage. After you've been at this stage for a while, making slow and steady progress, you eventually get to the, I'm just speaking Chinese stage, which is advanced. So um, it's probably easiest to just read from Sinosplice. In this stage, the learner is not in the least surprised by his improved communication abilities because he got there through prolonged hard work. Learners who make it to this level can most likely read and write as well because of the level of dedication involved. Also, learning advanced grammar patterns and expanding vocabulary is most efficiently accomplished through extensive reading in Chinese. You know for sure you're in this stage when the only new vocabulary or grammar patterns come to you through reading or the news. I think at this stage, your Chinese ceases to become like a novelty, right? It just becomes something that's a little bit more functional. I, I notice this when I'm around um, like my family. My immediate family have kids. They all speak Chinese. So they went to Chinese schools and they're going to Chinese dual immersion schools here in the U.S. So we can speak Chinese to each other. Once in a while, I'll speak to my kids in Chinese, especially I want to talk to them and not have other people understand what we're saying. So I'll just you know, say something in Chinese and it just seems normal. It's just like, yeah, I'm just speaking Chinese. It's just a normal language. And sometimes even when I'm speaking Chinese, uh, the people I'm around, even if they don't speak Chinese, my first inclination is that, oh, they totally understand what I'm saying just because, you know, this is a language that's comprehensible, at least to me. And I have to remind myself, oh, wait, you know, they, they don't speak the language. I think at this stage, it's just kind of normal, right? It's just something that's kind of part of your life, part of you. Yeah, so at this stage, um, it is totally normal. You're used to speaking Chinese, using Chinese, communicating in Chinese. But that doesn't mean you're done, right? There's plenty left to learn. Also at this stage, if you're around other Chinese people and you speak Chinese to them for the first time, you know, they don't know you, you just, you know, say ni hao or whatever it is you're saying to them in Chinese. When they turn around and say, oh, need a zhongwen tai hao la, they compliment your Chinese. It's, it means a little bit less. I don't know about you, John. How does, what does it feel like to you at this stage when people compliment your Chinese? Um, I don't mind it if it's, if it's a, a quick thing. You know, it's polite. Um, that's kind of a part of Chinese culture. But if they make it into this huge thing, it, it gets kind of tiresome. So some of the most pleasant interactions are people that don't even acknowledge that I'm a non-native speaker of Chinese. They just talk to me like a regular person about a relatively complex topic, and they don't ever compliment me. I love that. <laughs> It's refreshing, especially when all you say is like ni hao, and they're like, oh, your Chinese is so good. And I'm like, I just said ni hao, right? <laughs> okay, so then the final stage I have on here is the pretty much Chinese uh, stage, which is native. Like your, your pronunciation vocabulary are probably better than a lot of China's because not everyone speaks a standard Mandarin in China. 
But often to get to this level, you got to spend a lot of time in China or you have a Chinese spouse or you're just, your life is China. Yeah, I'm, I'm not at this stage. This is like the John Pasden stage. That's, that's what I put this at. Well, I, I'm not native-like um, all the time. Sometimes I feel like I'm pretty native-like, but certain conversations, I don't feel like I'm native-like. For example, I couldn't have an intelligent native-like conversation on like the literary merits of certain works. Like I would regress to, to a babbling idiot in a conversation like that. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm trying to push my overall level up to this level um, across the board. But um, it, it is nice when I feel like I'm in that level. I just know that it's not uh, descriptive of my entire level. Well, I think that brings out something an important aspect here is that this is all context dependent, right? Like it, it depends on what we're talking about. And that's where our vocabulary experience is in. Like, let's say even in English, let's say you put me a, a, in a group of nuclear physicists and they're all talking about nuclear physics. I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to really follow this conversation. They're going to be using all sorts of words, terms and things I don't understand. It, but it's going to be very similar like that in Chinese. Right. But if you're an educated adult, then I'm pretty sure you don't want to like have the Chinese fluency of a third grader, right? Your goal is fluency that matches an educated adult. And so, yeah, that's quite a challenge and quite a bit of work. Now, there's one other scale among these stages of learning Chinese that someone had once related to me, and I, I love to bring this up. It's kind of fun. So stage one, you know nothing. Stage two, you think you know everything. Stage three, you're afraid you'll never know anything. Stage four, you realize you know just a little bit. I think that one's a little bit more on the humorous side, but uh, I think it's a little bit accurate. In the end, you realize that once you get into Chinese, you're you're going to know just a little bit. And that's okay because that little bit can go a long way. That's right. You know, even if you know a little bit, it's important to be proficient in what it is you know. Not trying to plug our uh, Mandarin companion, but our graded readers here, you know, like uh, our level one uses 300 basic characters. And I always tell people, well, you know, if you only know 300 characters or 300 words, you know, this has to be fluent in those three or 400 characters. And it creates like a really strong base that you can then build off of. And you move up along the stages of learning the language. Right. So a lot of people are obsessed with just expanding the number of characters they know, expanding the number of words they know, but they're not super familiar or fluent with any of those. And um, that does not result in fluency. So it's like a pyramid. You know, the base has got to be wider, bigger, stronger than the peak. And so people are just continue trying to expand out the top, you know, into all these, you know, branches and maybe, you know, specialized areas, but they don't have a basic grasp of the grammar or you know, just how verbs are used and everything like that, then it's going to be hard for them to achieve higher levels of proficiency. Or I kind of think of it as trying to build um, a tower using sand. You know, you, you got to have a strong foundation down there. It's just going to keep crumbling as you keep adding on top of it. All right. And now we have a word from our sponsor, which is Mandarin Companion. And today we want to talk about our new breakthrough level, which is coming out this week. Our breakthrough level is our new graded reader stories consisting of only 150 unique characters. Okay, so this was a lot of work. We started with level one being 300 characters. This is half of that. So uh, 150 characters it sounds like a lot, but um, to tell a story, it's, uh, it's just barely enough. But the good news is if you've studied Chinese for about a year, you, you might be around the right level, 150 characters, to read stories. So these stories are not as long as our level one. Um, they're about half the length, which is, I think, a mercy when you're a beginner. It's hard to, to read that much Chinese. But um, if you keep plugging away, you'll get lots of uh, repetition for those 150 basic characters, and you can read actual stories. So breakthrough level. Come check it out uh, to mandarincompanion.com. Now, let's get on to our rants and raves. Now, John, uh, shall I start or do you want to start off this one? I will start because I have a feeling you're going to do a lot more talking in this one. That's because my rave is for something that I haven't actually experienced much yet, but um, I have to rave about it because I've heard from so many people about how good it is. And that is the China History Podcast. It's by Laszlo Montgomery, and um, it covers all different topics of Chinese history. These are not short podcasts. They're pretty long. But, you know, if you're into history, especially Chinese history, you probably want a little bit of depth there. And uh, this podcast does it. 
that is a super cool podcast. I've listened to, I don't know, probably at least 20 podcasts by him. Really, really good. Yeah, I keep hearing that. Especially like I was always been interested in like the the different dynasties and I, I really knew nothing about it. Like I in school, I never learned anything about the Chinese dynasty. So I, you know, I started listening up. I think they started the Song dynasty and worked their way up and fantastic, well-researched, super informative, um, relevant. And yes, there's some just cool historical stories about, you know, foreigners in China and stuff. A really cool podcast. So glad you brought that up, man. That's a great podcast. Awesome. And I am going to listen to it more. Um, I'm not really a history buff, but, you know, the further along I go with uh, my Chinese life, uh, the more I realize there's a a history-shaped hole in there that I need to fill in. Okay, I have a rant. And my rant came from the the NCLC conference, National Chinese Language Conference. I was at this last week. Let's just let's put it this way. There's a lot of exhibitors at this conference. And so there's all like the Peking University Press, you know, Lingua, all the big publishers and lots of people offering educational materials and so forth. And so I had a teacher come along and she was looking at our books and she's just like, it's not hard enough. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, no, this is it's not hard enough. I need harder stuff. And next next to me was actually a guy who was, had some uh, more challenging material, something we'll touch, discuss in a future podcast. And I said, well, you know, you might want to look at this. And she's like, she goes, just no, not hard enough, not hard enough. And I'm, I, I'm like, well, what kind of students do you have? It's like, she's like, well, we're like a very like intense school, and we had to have the hard materials and stuff. She came with this a, what appeared to me a very traditional mindset of saying, hey, you know, let's give students like hard material that has lots of new characters and words in it so that they can study and and learn them. And I'm just like, oh, man. Thankfully, out of probably the 200, 300 teachers I talked to at the conference, there was one who seemed to be dogmatic about that. And uh, those teachers, I hope we get some teachers or they learn (laughs) some better ways uh, about teaching students about how how we learn the language. And uh, and I hope that maybe, you know, their perspectives changes over time. But that was a bit of my rant there. It was kind of funny. One of the exhibitors who crossed from me, he's also in Chinese education. He came up to me. He's like, yeah, man, your stuff's too easy. We just need hard stuff here. So we had a little bit of laugh about that. Yeah, I guess that was my rant there as as, as teachers who just think that the students need crazy hard stuff to learn the language. Well, fortunately, I think a lot of teachers are getting on board with stuff like graded readers because they're realizing that when you're always piling on the new characters and the new vocabulary, it's not fun. It's discouraging and you just don't have any wins. And then the students drop out. And uh, what happens when the students keep dropping out of a Chinese program? The, the program itself may be in danger at the university, at the high school, or it just always stays really small. And so it's a win for all the teachers to keep the students in the Chinese learning program. And one of the ways to do that is to help them enjoy what they're learning and give them stuff they can actually enjoy. Oh, I, you know what? You're, you're totally right. I am thankful to say that it's actually nice when I talk to a teacher and I show them our books and they're like, oh, these are too hard for my students. And I say, yes. Good, thank you. You're right. You know, if it's too hard for them, don't give it to them. You know, wait. You know, maybe it might be another year or two or uh, in down the line where they're going to be ready for this. But I, I have a lot of respect for those teachers that just, you know, right off the say, oh, yeah, this is too hard for my t- students. Or most of my students is good, but it's going to be a stretch for some. You know, then we can talk about that, how to be, how to help them catch up a little bit. But you know, it seems to me that nowadays a lot of teachers get this. They, yeah. they they really do. They seem to get like, hey, we give them too hard of stuff. They're, it's just going to be, they're not going to learn from it. And I got to say, it seems like the teachers that I meet in the States or the teachers that, that teach Chinese in the States, and we're talking about, you know, native Chinese speakers, a lot of them seem to have, you know, come around to this way of thinking. Whereas so many of the teachers in China, they're still in a very traditional mindset. Uh, that kind of makes sense a little bit because I think the teachers who come to America to teach Chinese, um, you know, they have to level up on their English a little bit. You know, pretty much all of them are going to speak English at a, a, a somewhat proficient level. Um, back in China, they may not have had that experience in stretching their, their English as much. I think it's one of the things of actually having gone through learning the language, learning a second language and stuff helps them to gain that learner's perspective on teaching as a second language. Yeah, and I think a big part of it is that in China, everyone learns English as a second language. You don't have a choice. It's not like the teacher didn't make it interesting, so we dropped out. No, you can't drop out. You're going to be learning English for your entire uh, you know, education. 
And so the teachers don't have an incentive to keep it interesting. And, you know, in China, people kind of like to do things the traditional way a lot of the time. Whereas in the States, they'll, they'll eventually learn. It's like, oh, wait a minute. So the students don't like the way that we're teaching so they can just drop out. Um, yeah, that affects things. Yeah, that's an insightful point. And I, I think it's interesting for listeners to know that you know, like in China, as you're saying, they have to study English. To graduate from college, you have to, what is it, the CET4? Yeah, or CET6 for English majors. Yeah, so it's an actual Chinese exam that you have to pass in order to get your college degree. And it doesn't matter what you're studying, you have, everyone has to pass the CET4 to graduate from college. Okay, so enough ranting, Jared. Um, we have a awesome interview coming up, right? Yeah, I'm really excited about this interview. This interview is going to offer a whole lot of historical perspective on learning Chinese. Because what was it like to learn Chinese back in the 70s? Well, you're going to find out right now. Hi, Jared. Good to be here with you. It's good to be here with you, too. At the National Chinese Language Conference in San Diego, I had the privilege to sit down with this distinguished individual. I'm John D'Andrea. There aren't many people around like John. Well, I'm originally from New York, but I've been based out of Tucson, Arizona for a long time. In his career, he's worked as a teacher, translator, and administrator, but this is what he's doing today world languages specialist for the Tucson Unified School District. A job that wasn't supposed to be long-term, but you know how life turns out sometimes. They only asked for help for about a year or two, and that was eight years ago. <laughs> so I'm still there. <laughs> One more thing about John that is very relevant to this interview is his age. I'm 65. This interview gave me immense appreciation for what it's like to learn Chinese in our modern age and engendered even more respect for those who years ago blazed the trails we now walk with relative ease. Side note, this was recorded in his hotel room, and we had a small audio problem. So it's a bit hard to hear me, but John comes across loud and clear. Stay with us. I wanted, really, to be an astronaut. Oh. I, I grew up during the time when... You know, we were trying to beat the Russians to the moon and, uh, you know, impressionable young man. And uh, we all wanted to do, do our part. So I watched all the space shots. And, yes, I'm going to the moon. And I was prepared to do that. I couldn't do it. Main, well, for a couple of reasons. One was the Vietnam War and uh, the and, and, dis, and, and universities taking away um, ROTC programs. So in those days... Uh, to be an astronaut, you had to have been a, a test pilot for the Marines, Navy, or Air Force. It was decided for me when I chose the University of Arizona. Eyesight is not 2020 uncorrected. They weren't going to offer me a, uh, a scholarship. So I was very dismayed. But about that time, President Nixon had sent uh, Kissinger to... Peking, as we used to say in the old days, uh, to meet with Zhou Enlai and Mao Zedong. That's, so. a, that's a bit of history for yes. any Chinese learners, just about that right. whole connection. Yes. We, we yeah. didn't have any diplomatic relations. We, we just didn't have right. diplomatic relations with China at all. Right, at all, not until July, uh, January 1st, 1979. So uh, in the early 70s, and we started that ping-pong diplomacy, I figured, well, if I can't go to the moon... Uh, <laughs> Go to, as close as I can get. <laughs> you know, that's the thinking of an 18-year-old. And my mother was an Army Air Corps nurse with the Flying Tigers. Oh, was she? Yes. She during, was in China? She was in China uh, towards the end of uh, the Second World War. Oh, wow. And working with the old Flying Tiger folks. So How did, how, how did that happen? I uh, Just, you know... It's the war effort. And She's got a sign there. She got a sign, yeah, you know, because, you know, the right way, the wrong way, the Army way. But uh, Mom was able to move into that area where the Flying Tigers were. And where was that? In, China? in Kunming. Kunming. Oh, so that's yeah. in the southern China, border yeah. of Vietnam. I, in fact, uh, when uh, I went to China, this is jumping ahead, but when I, I, I took my mom to visit the area where she served for the last couple of years of the war, and 
we drove around and wow. yeah, no, it was pretty cool. So you had some sort of connection to China. I, I did. And uh, there was someone else in my cl- high school class that took Chinese. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I grew up in New York where everybody was from somewhere else. Yeah. So now why did you actually decide to study Chinese? Well, I, I thought it would be the future. I thought there was something, because it was something new again, and I thought this would be something that would I would have opportunities. I, I didn't know, uh, you know. <laughs> I made some decisions that were not based in reality, but I think that one was based on my hoping that uh, this would pan out to do something I'd be interested in. Oh. So how did you start learning? I mean, was it a university oh. program, high school, what? Well, it's interesting you mentioned I, I, I was a sophomore in university. Again, I went to the university to study astronomy and physics and such. But in, in Arizona. In Arizona, the University of Arizona. Because of the what was going on with ping pong diplomacy and such, the, the university beefed up their Oriental Studies Department. That's what we used to call it. Mm-hmm. Anything from the Bosporus to the Sea of Japan, that's the, the Orient. <laughs> we were the Occident. There's an old British way of doing things and uh, or understanding the world. So in those days, the center of Sinology was really the University of Michigan. And you had a lot of these young scholars looking for work. And so the University of Arizona was one of the schools that offered a, an opportunity for these freshly minted PhDs to get on a tenure track. And so we got some really good people, including some people who had been around longer. Bill Schultz, who used to be the editor of the Journal for Chinese uh, Literature. So and he was ooh, good guy, tough guy, but good guy. And then we had a lot of young scholar types, Steve West, who's still working around, Tim Light, things like that. So then tell me, so you started taking classes at the University of Arizona. What was this like? I mean, how were your classmates? Just tell me that experience. Well, from what I remember uh, a few Sundays ago, there were, I believe, two or three classes of Chinese. Now that I understand it, they used a, a, a woman from Taiwan who was a graduate student in some department I didn't know. And she became our teacher, Zhu Tai Tai. So Zhu Tai Tai was our teacher, and we started with 60 students in the first year. Her pronunciation was great because I think her parents were from Beijing area, so... So her pronunciation was standard. Well, we didn't call it Putonghua, but you know. What did you call it? Zhongwen. Oh, okay. <laughs> Zhongwen. We didn't have the concept of Putonghua. Then. Not yet. No, we didn't. You know, or you know, Zhongguohua. You know. Nice. And um, so the material that was chosen as textbook was uh, John De Francis's uh, books. Now, now to, oh. for our listeners, John DeFrancis, right. he's kind of legendary. Really. The, le- the, the dude. So, d- tell us about John DeFrancis and how, what, what kind of influence he had on the classroom. A little bit about him. Well, John DeFrancis, I believe, was really intelligent, but he uh, worked out of Taiwan. He had a language informant helping him with his materials. And he really set up a kind of graded approach to teaching Chinese. There were like a whole set of books. There were the, the character book of the the dialogues for the teacher and then the but they use bopomofo okay bopomofo is used in uh, taiwan, used in taiwan which i think is a great system by the way i really do but i i enjoy pinging too because you know it's the letters but bopomofo i i think is a very clever system so he had a book for the chinese characters for the dialogues for the teacher we had the pinyin version for the dialogues for the and the, you know language practice and grammar practice for that then there were a, a reader, it was a thick book. It was like 15 chapters. The first year's reading was two books, about 30 chapters or 40 chapters. You started off with very basic characters and you built up from there. And it was a great system. I really thought it was very clever how he arranged the readers to be graded. It was only a beginning, intermediate, advanced, but it was a good start. And I think it was a very clever way of arranging and so the students could improve their levels. It was rather dated because he had written it a good number of years before I started. And it was all in traditional characters. And all in traditional characters, which I still enjoy, but thank God for simplified. <laughs> <laughs> you always forget one of those uh, in, 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 in when writing some of the traditional characters. And I had an opportunity years and years later to actually meet him. He actually came over to us. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah, so we were in, um, it was the first Sino-Tibetan language and linguistics conference held in, in China. Oh. And here's this fella, an old guy, you know, because 
I think I'm, I'm older than he was now than he was. In. And, you know, all of us younger scholar wannabes, and uh, we're all sitting around at this conference, and here comes this fellow over, and it's like, this is the dude. This is the man. This wow. is John DeFran. And he wanted to talk with us and kind of get some feedback from us, and I thought that was very gracious and wonderful. He was a, We had a grand time talking with him. So you're using the John DeFrancis materials yes. in your college course. In our college courses, we use the John DeFrancis text. Now, there was the other ones, and our instructors inc- encouraged us to also look at the New Haven materials and just kind of get to see how they did their version of Pinyin, the Yale uh, romanization system. And, of course, we had to learn Wade Giles because all the materials about Chinese were written in Wade Giles' uh, romanization system. So just for our listeners, we're talking about different early systems of of what we now determine to call pinyin. Pinyin, right. So all there's different spellings of, of how you do right. the phonetic representation. Right, right, right. And, you know, Peking is really based from the, I think, the 1909 or 1911 International Postal Union way. And they used a, a French romanization system. Oh, all right, so uh, so you're mm-hmm. studying in college now. What were right. the classes like? You, know, you talk about your materials, but what was that experience like learning Chinese in the classroom? Oh, well, uh, Zhu Taidei was a great taskmaster, not a nasty person, but she really encouraged us to do all the work all the time. So we went to class four days a week, plus the fifth day was lab. So we sat in the laboratory, this old-style language lab, with, uh, we're, we're in little mini cubicles alone, listening to tapes and repeating what was said, and then Zhu Tai Tai would listen in and correct our pronunciation for an hour a day. So we had five hours a week of Chinese. So we learned um, dialogues, and we learned lots of characters uh, based on what was required for that year. Second year was murder. How so? Uh, 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 Second year Chinese was heavy on character reading and recognition. How was that presented to you or taught oh, to you? Oh, here's the book. Read. And let's go through it. Wow. Uh, and pronunciation, we, we had very few uh, Chinese, overseas Chinese, in at least in Arizona. So it was difficult to practice my pronunciation. And actually, interpersonal communication was next to nil, except for Zhu Tai Tai. And every once in a while, you see someone else. In fact, I, I have a funny story. It was about... About the end of my second year learning Chinese, and there was a fella from Taiwan who opened up a store a few miles away from uh, the university. I didn't have a car. I mean, who had a car? <laughs> I was a poor scholar. Hanshir is the word for that. And I was definitely one of those. <laughs> so I, f- I was able to figure out a way to get to that guy's store. And I'm in a store, so I figure out I've got to buy something. And I, but I didn't have that much money, so I, I, I think I bought a couple pencils or something, something silly. But I, I just wanted to talk to somebody in Chinese. <laughs> and I gave him the pencils and the money, and I said, uh, xie xie, as best as I could. And he looked at me and said, bu xie. And I was shocked. He could see the shock all over my face because <laughs> I had no idea what he meant or what he said. <laughs> Because in the dialogue, it says, if I say xie xie, you're supposed to say be a kachi. <laughs> but he didn't say that. I said, oh, crumbs. I mean, here's my first opportunity to speak Chinese, and I messed it up already terribly. But he could tell. Thank God he knew. He, he, could, he could read my face and said, no, bu xie, bu xie xie. And I went, oh, I get it. And actually, that was the one of the best lessons I ever had was a real person telling me and, and correct and, and letting me understand that there's more than one way mm. to learn Chinese. And just because the dialogue says, yes, yeah, and you have to say, be a that ain't the only way. We do the same thing. Years later, I became an ESL teacher. I would use and we would encourage other people to understand that there's more than one way to respond in English. If someone says, how you doing? Mm-hmm. And, and that's, and I have a funny story on that. But I mean, <laughs> usually it's, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. And you, no. But, yeah. And I tell people, if you don't understand what somebody says to you, just copy what they just said. You know, somebody says hi, you say hi. If someone says hello, you say hello. 
Someone says good afternoon, you say good afternoon. Same thing mm-hmm. in Chinese and any other language. So you are really focusing on, on learning characters, on, on yes. reading at this point. On but reading. You, but you sounds like you didn't really have opportunities to really speak that language. Not at all. In fact, uh, rolling years ahead, I had a, after I graduated, I stayed on and became a graduate student in Chinese linguistics at the University of Arizona with a, a fantastic mentor teacher. After that, uh, I stayed on uh, and uh, I got a master's degree and still couldn't speak a lick. But I, but I, but I had read by that time Confucius in, in original unpunctuated text. Wow. Yes, and Mencius and all the other fellows. Well, know, I mean, how was your reading level at that point? A I pretty. Mean, you read uh, it, but I mean, how was your comprehension of, of the language? Not that great. Because I was reading old style Chinese. About that time, we were able to get some um, mainland Chinese materials uh, for teaching Chinese to non Chinese. And, you know, then I learned words like machine gun, hand grenade, (laughs) because they're all revolutionary materials. And so it was a a mishmash of different vocabulary sets, uh, semantic fields of, of, of words. But I got tired of reading and reading because there was no pleco. There was no. <laughs> well, wait, this this is something I want to hear from you because, like, I mean, today I've got we got yeah. smartphones. Oh right? yeah, optical readers can point it out that right. The character exactly like, tap on the electronic on. your screen whatever. Right, right. So, well, what were you doing that day? Because obviously you're playing uh, characters all the time. You don't know all, all the time. In fact, the same character. I I just saw that character two paragraphs ago, and I still forgot it. Yeah. So it's I had horrible. to very oh man. So I had to crack open the dictionary. And tell us how that works. Well, by radical, and sometimes you didn't get the radical correctly, or you counted the number of strokes incorrectly, or at least different from the book. And we used fens. It was fen f e double n, blue covered with a large character z on top. I got to hate that book because I was always opening it up. Oh, and all it was also in Wade Giles. So, I mean, oh, okay. there so you the go. Romanization. romanization was different from Pinyin. But, I mean, it was a great book. Thank you for the dictionary. But it was murder mm. uh, to use because I was using it too much. And I, I think I do. Oh, I forgot it. Mm-hmm. And one time, I remember I just got so tired. I was going to pick up that book and throw it with all my might at the wall <laughs> and watch it blow up on the wall. Papers go everywhere, but I didn't do it because I still didn't have any money. My mentor teacher uh, did give me a wonderful gift, though. Uh, it was the first uh, mainland Chinese, Chinese-English dictionary, English-Chinese, Chinese dictionary. And I still have it. It was a zidian, well, not a zidian. It was a, oh. a word dictionary, not just character so dictionary. So this is when you could look up the word in English and find the character? Yes. and But then I have to switch back because it didn't give the pinyin on it. So I have oh. to open up. But at least I got words, larger sets of words. I see. So, so uh, how long would it take you to look up a character? <sighs> 30 seconds a minute. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're looking up... 10, 15 characters in a short paragraph or something or a page. It got a lot longer than skimming through a book. I think yeah. nowadays, you know, we, we would call that like reading below 90% comprehension, reading pain. <laughs> Definitely reading pain. <laughs> no, I didn't mind the reading. I, I mean, uh, we got some good things to read. It was very interesting. But it was mostly grammar translation since we were reading old Zhang Guozi and some of these old style, you know, histories and, and things. It was real, but I was still looking up characters all the time and I got really tired of it. Well, but, this this is actually something that I, most learners can relate to. Okay, yeah. you are like, you're in the, the trough of despair, you <laughs> yeah, know, in learning. And you, which yeah. you was the mountain you were climbing was much steeper. Yeah. So why did you stick with it? Why did you stay learning Chinese? Why did you just give up or did you ever feel like giving up? No, I never felt like giving up. Oh, I, I guess I'm like a Gila monster. I grab onto you. I'm, I'm not letting go. You know, I wanted to be an astronaut the same way. I was going to do it and do it and do it. And I didn't care. I mean, we were against the Vietnam War. But I mean, I, if I had to become a, a uniformed military person to be a test pilot to fly, I'll, I'll, I'll put up with it. But I, I needed a vision. And I went with the vision that I had. So what carried you through this, uh, these difficult times? In learning? The hope of being in China. That was the hope of somehow being involved with China and getting really, really good at the language so that I could be of some use to someone or some people or 
whatever. So you went on, you studied a graduate right. degree. You, right. You spent some time in academia. It I like. did. Yeah. I, I, I mean, there was a committee to test me on my master's degree in Chinese linguistics and pass that. I already had presented my thesis and my printed thesis was, I don't know, 60, 80 pages, whatever it was. And then I had the oral interview with, you know, again, I had Bill Schultz, I had Ron Meow, I had all these other people, Steve West and Tim Light, right? They're all asking me questions and I passed. So I went home and my wife goes, I was married by that time. I've skipped out a lot of stuff, but I, I was married by the time. I needed someone to support my habit. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, honey. I appreciate it. And she goes, now what? <laughs> so I went back to school and got a master's degree in ESL. Only took a year. It was easy. And then I got to teach, which was actually a good thing because I got to teach students from other countries. I, I stayed out at the U of A, and uh, I got involved with the University of Arizona People Republic of China Scholarly Communications Committee. That's quite the acronym. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, I, I don't think we we couldn't even say it in one word. But I was the I was the new kid on the block. All right, but my job was to interview the scholars that were coming now to the university. And the committee on the U.S. side, uh, U of A side, they wanted to know how well the, the scholars were doing and then how well the departments were with the scholars who were, who were good in theory, but uh, in practical things. They didn't have the wherewithal in China at the time on the, on the practical side. So I was involved with that. So I got to use more Chinese. So this is throughout the 70s, and I studied through 76, 78, 79, and then January 1st, 1979, President Carter goes, okay, we're swapping recognition of who is China. So off we went, and now we're with People's Republic of China, and then they started coming by looking for English teachers. Oh. Yes, and I was actually teaching English at the Center for English as a Second Language at the University of Arizona by that time. And so I, we applied my wife and I, and we were, there were some interests from the Zhao Yubu in China, Ministry of Education, and they were looking for foreign experts. Ah, yes. And that's what we used to be called, Wai Guo Zhuan Jia. Interesting to be an expert at 27 years old. But <laughs> <laughs> so my wife and I went, and it was interesting because my mentor's old Yaley buddy, a guy named Charlie Blatchford, they were the first ones right after the change to the People's Republic of China. So he and his wife and two children went to Lanzhou University in Gansu Province. Oh, that, that's in more north-central China. Yeah, out there, well, well, they say the northwest, but, you know, they were looking for a replacement. And so my mentor, Tim Light, said, hey, why don't you contact Charlie and see if you can put your, your name in for him and he'll recognize name you. And Charlie wrote letters nearly every day, at least several times a week, back to home to family about what it was like to live in northwest China in 79, 81. So long story short, we got out there. It, where? To Gansu, to Lanzhou, Gan Lanzhou. Lanzhou and uh, Lanzhou Dashi. Yeah. Famous for the Lanzhou La Mian. Yeah, La Mian. And, uh, but I like you know, pizza. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Lanzhou La Mian and Yoro Mian and all that. So we got to go there. And my wife, since she was older... She got to teach the first one since the reopening of the entrance exam to the university. They didn't quite call it the Gaokao then, but the year of 77, those who started in the year 1977. So she was slightly older than the oldest one in the class, so then they listened to her. Mm. And so my wife taught, and then I, we taught students from the grade that started in 1977 through 81. And then I also got to teach uh, the retreads, we used to call them, former Russian teachers who were now told, you will now teach English. Oh, so interesting. <laughs> they, they were teaching uh, what they called general English, not English for majors. They taught just your usual second language that you must have. So my job was to encourage and help these former Russian teachers. So now you're back in China. This is yes. years? Yes, uh, between 81 and 83, teaching 83. at, at Landro Dacia. Now, how did your Chinese progress during that? Time? Well, it was very funny. Here I'm in China, very excited. Yeah, man, I'm gonna, my Chinese is really going to go to town. Well, there's a problem. Uh, I was in Gansu, and most of the, not most, I would say a large number of people on campus were from Shanghai. They all had been sent down to the countryside, and every single one of them was trying to figure out a way to get back and you know, change their you know, hukou back to Shanghai. So a lot of them spoke Shanghainese on campus. Oh, really? Yeah. 
<laughs> and the others who had been in Gansu a long time, and the people on the street outside Landa, they all spoke Lanzhouhua. And did they speak Putonghua? Uh, uh, Standard Mandarin? <laughs> Not many. Really? Not many. Uh, people didn't move around as much then. You pretty much stayed for where you'd been growing up or if you'd been sent to the countryside during the uh, the 10 years there. So. so it was kind of difficult to find people who spoke standard Mandarin Chinese. So, so you even had a hard time communicating after all your studying. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, oh, I remember. Because by that time I had my son with me, and my son was not – verbal yet so anyway we got in late late at night and so they dumped us off at about three o'clock in the morning to everybody's dead tired they were so kind so wonderful to meet us at the airport and this so we'll come by and get you around noon for lunch great we crashed out on the bed we were all dead tired all of a sudden ah oh, they're here it's, oh, it's a little before noon all right well no problem we're ready and it's this woman this older woman she opened the door. And, I mean, opened the door and looked at her. And she looked at me, Ni Ho. <laughs> and we're using this. She's from Linxia, which is even more distant. So she walked in like she owned the place. And she basically did. She was the Baumu for, I think, the whole building. Uh-huh. And this was not that we were not in a, a foreign experts building because we were the only Westerners west of Xi'an. So anyway, she walked in and she had two Nua I mean, you know, these hot water bottles that were are ubiquitous or used to be ubiquitous. Yeah, they still are. <laughs> and they still are, right? And she put them down and and explained how to use the curtains because, you know, obviously, you know, we're Westerners. We don't know how to use curtains. And she was explaining all kinds of stuff, I believe, because... She was in there and, and showed us, and this, we followed her around, and she would say, come on, and, I mean, with her hand, I, her mouth was moving. I had no idea. So, <laughs> very nice one. She walked out, my wife said, well, what did she say? And I said, I have no idea. One word what she said. <laughs> wow. Where am I, you know? So, Wang Ai, it took me about a year to understand her. I mean, salt of the earth, wonderful person. She, she was just great. I and mean, she took care of my our son, you know, for a while. And and so my son started speaking Landro, Landro Hua. And, and I, <laughs> but uh, Wang Ai, wow, what a dialect. So you spent that time in yeah. teaching English in yes. Hangzhou. Right. So what about some inflection points in your Chinese? Like, okay, because oh. you run into the situation, it sounds like you got to China, you've right. been studying more academically right. Chinese, but you didn't have like, that verbal communication. I did not. And you came into an environment where they didn't even speak your, what that, you were studying. That's right? correct. That's right. In Beijing, you know, we're met by this wonderful woman and uh, who's going to take care of us and get us on the next plane. We brought everything. We had, we'd had no idea. We had boxes and boxes. One of the boxes broke, and I said, oh, I just need a belt and you know, tie it up or some rope, but I didn't know how to say that in Chinese. I, I could tell you the, the name of the third minister of accounting in Qing Dynasty, you know, because they all wore different hats and each hat had a different name and all this, but I couldn't say the word, I need a belt or a rope to tie up the box. Mm-hmm. I didn't know how to say that. Mm-hmm. And this woman's English was not great either because how many times did she use English? I mean, she was pretty good, but you know, there, yeah. there was a lot of words. But I think a turning point was I try to emulate what people say. I stopped it when I was on um, a train going back to Beijing. And you know how it, uh, the trains are, the, the crew either it originates in Beijing and goes back or it originates in Lanzhou and then goes back, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, this train was originating, they were all from Beijing. And here I am, I get on the train and I sound like this local yokel, <laughs> Lanzhou guy, and they all made fun of, not in a bad way, but they were, thought it was very funny yeah. that I didn't speak Pudonghua, that I spoke this Lanzhou Hua. Yeah. So I, I said right then and there, that's it. I'm, Despite the fact that everybody in Lanzhou talks like this, I'm not going to emulate them. I'm going to emulate what I learned in school and what is standard throughout the country. Well, it's trying to be standard throughout the country. But it, it took a, a real situation where I was trying to explain things, but I, I would sound like some hick. I mean, not not sound derogatory, but yeah. someone in the, in the West were speaking with a Southern accent. Like, exactly, a, right? Or a like, Chinese person learning right. a Southern accent. I, re- I remember a Korean uh, comedian, Korean American com- comedian, mm-hmm. that grew up in Tennessee, 
And he gets up there, and, and, and he looks very Asian and everything. Goes, and he opens his mouth and says, how y'all doing? You all, you all thought I was going to talk like that. Hong, hong, hong. You know, no, I'm from Tennessee. You know, yeah. Korean-American fellow, a comedian. This was some years ago. But. So, all right. So, you, you've been teaching. And what kind of happened next? I mean, what kind, you're, you're now, you've been a Chinese teacher for a number of years. Yes. Education. Yes. What kind of made that leap for you? Well, after the two years were up, because they at that time they, you weren't allowed to extend past two years, so we went back. But I didn't go into Chinese language education for a while. I got into uh, business, not mine, but I mean other people's business, and I found an opportunity to become a, an interpreter for U.S. companies trying to do business in China. So I did that for oh, a long, long time, many decades, and then... Towards the end, uh, after 9-11 happened, things started to slow down internationally business-wise. People pulled back a little bit. And so um, a friend in my wife's office said, you know, why doesn't John help us keep the Chinese program going here? And my wife mentioned it to me. I go, nah, I mean, I, I, I want to find a, you know, go back into, you know, whatever business needs my assistance. And so um, I said no. So they had an interview series, and they chose nobody. And again, they tried finding people to teach, but they couldn't find anybody who was able to become certified in teaching. And so uh, the third time was the charm, and I said, okay, I'll go to the interview, but I won't, you know, I'm not promising that I'm going to do well. Well, they took me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> there was one other Chinese fella teaching, and so part of my work was to teach and then also to help uh, expand the Chinese language program. I actually took a leave of absence for one year. As, and during the time, the department that I was in, it was called the Pan-Asian Department, uh, went away. It was The funding changed and all that. So a number of Chinese teachers dropped. And then people move and, you know, do other things. And then so now when I got back, I was sent to a language acquisition department. Well, something I'm interested to hear okay. from your perspective okay. is this. Is, is, you started studying Chinese roughly 40 years ago. Uh, yeah, 40, do the arithmetic, yeah, 46. 1973, I was a sophomore in the university. So, wow, 46 years, years ago. ago. Yeah. Uh, what, from that time, from you, mm -hmm. when you started studying till right now, what do you feel are some of the biggest changes that have happened in Chinese education mm. that maybe today that we take for granted or we don't even realize what a big shift it's been. Technology. Uh, the, <laughs> I love Pleco. I love anything where I can look up a character either by handwriting it or by typing in the pinyin and getting words. The technology has been really good. Uh, all the YouTube videos, all something you, you, know, you and John do, uh, I, I, I follow it. Because it's it's a way I can let other pe younger people see, hey, I mean, this is something you can do as well. But there's so many different avenues that you can pursue with the language than what I had in the past. Oh, and what I didn't say was all the, uh, let's say, the three-lettered organizations that were after me when I first came back from China. Oh, oh yeah, because oh, okay, yeah. all, the, all the organizations, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah, yes, I see. Um, yeah. Uh, they were all interested in my experiences and my future ambitions, which they hoped would have included some of their interests. Mm -hmm. And uh, I declined, not out of anything else other than I, I wanted a freedom to choose what I wanted to do. We had another person in our Oriental Studies Department years ago who did a, a summer with one of them. And next time I saw him, it was a while, about a year or so later, and he said, I, I, there's a lot of stuff I can't do. And I was very surprised, and that, that mm -hmm. took me. You know, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I didn't want to so do it. It wasn't a good fit. It wasn't a good fit for me personally, not yeah. that it isn't for others. And so, but the, the number of opportunities are much more multiplied now. Mm -hmm. You can work for a Chinese company here in the States. And in fact, yesterday, I think I'm, yesterday or the day before, I met a young woman who was, who's a stringer for Xinhua Xia. Xinhua Xia, right? Oh yeah, the, the news. The news, yeah. You can be you, news, you can be right, and you can be an American working for them, uh, or you could work for, 
yeah, there's Chinese companies opening up here and there's opportunities uh, in, in other countries as well. There's more opportunities in manufacturing, in, in import, export, in everything. I mean, I still have to read Chinese every day. I still have to practice Chinese every single day that I'm in the United States, but I have to do it every day. It's like breathing or eating. I mean, I have to do it. Otherwise, use it or lose it. I mean, I didn't grow up with this language, but I, I, I want to keep it fresh and alive. And I'm always learning new words and new ways of saying things. Things were a little too um, set. The phraseology is a lot more set in the old days than now. You have all the Internet things and you have texting and tweeting and all these things in you know jiong when would you have seen the word jiong oh, jiong, <laughs> jiong. That, that, that is the original chinese emoji right? emoji right the original chinese, chinese emoji, emoji yeah. right i mean you wouldn't have seen that 40 30 25 years ago even you know yeah. but now you do and there's so much more uh, the wide opportunities for using Chinese, plus the technological support, and more, and just surely more and more people learning Chinese. I was on a, a plane. I was talking to a woman from Honduras. I mean, I live in Arizona. My Spanish is yeah, okay, but my Chinese is a heck of a lot better. So we spoke in Chinese. Oh, she spoke Chinese? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, she was working for some company, in, in some Chinese company in Honduras or something like that. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's wild. That is wild. I mean, but so there you are. I mean, I, I got lost in France, in Paris. I didn't want to ask a Frenchman. So I went to a Chinese restaurant and asked them if how to get to a place. And yeah. Yeah, I got a good meal and I got the right directions. I made my way back. So, yeah, that's kind of- so everywhere you go, yeah. uh, even when I work for... Anywhere you go. I mean, Chinese is a useful language. There's a lot of people doing it and a lot of opportunities. So there. If you could go back and tell yourself when you had just started studying Chinese, right. if you could give yourself any advice, what would you have said? I don't think I, I would change anything. I, I don't. I'm, I'm a do it guy. I'm a guy that ganshuo. I mean, I tell a lot of the Chinese teachers here, you know, a lot of them, oh, my English, dare to speak. Hey, my Chinese isn't perfect. I don't care. Well, I mean, I do. But I, what I mean is I dare to speak. I, if, I, if I say it right, great. Bingo, right? If I don't say it right, they'll correct me. Thank you. Next time I'll remember, I hope. But I, again, that's the way I, I just say dare to do it. Take chances, especially if you're young. You can't mess up. Just do it. You can't mess up. I mean, unless you do something totally illegal or, or evil or something like that, but other than that, you can't mess up. Just do it. Give it a shot. If it works, great. If it doesn't, change it. You know, it's like I tell people this with basketball players. Everybody likes the NBA or something like that, right? And they make the shot every time. Really? No. Oh, I'm going to give up. I didn't make the shot every time. Really? We'd have no sports. I say do it. If it works, great. If not, try again. <laughs> Doesn't matter. People are a lot more forgiving than you think when it comes to communication. Oh, I didn't quite get it. Well, I'll speak louder then, okay? <laughs> <laughs> now you'll hear me. Yeah. But uh, uh, that was always me, though. I, I dared I dared to speak. I messed up so many times. I learned a lot. You have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmates, teachers, cousins, painter, chemist, vet, surfer, stuntman, architect, carpenter, dog walker, marine biologist, and that one guy named Max. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook and at mandarincompanion.com. Apologies to Mark Zuckerberg. We just ran out of time. The You Can Learn Chinese podcast is produced by myself, Jared Turner. I'd like to thank John D'Andrea and my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, John Pazin. See you next time.